Okay, if we can get everyone to come in and take a seat so we can get started. There are plenty of seats up here in the front and on the left and right towards the aisles. Okay, so before we get started, I'd just like to... Uh, Make a note in case anyone missed the opening workshops of the OBEYS conference or EFAB conference that uh, Dennis Lindley passed away on Monday. Uh, he was an honorary member of uh, ISBA and will be missed greatly by all of us. Um, both Adrian Smith and Steve Feinberg will provide a lot more details about his contributions to the Basin community and their talks, and there'll be more times to that during the Britain later agenda conference. Okay, so today we are celebrating 250 years of Bayes' theorem. Um, this is actually, for those of you that didn't realize it, it's the International Year of Statistics. And so a couple of years ago, many of the uh, presidents of the various statistical societies were together talking about how they could actually celebrate um, various events for their societies. Um, I guess I got to go to that meeting in place of one of the other past presidents and started to think, okay, what should we do as Bayesians to celebrate? Well, we weren't quite sure what year Bayes was born in. That seems to be a, there's some uncertainty about that date. Um, during that time, we'd actually just missed his death, so Isco couldn't go and celebrate that. And so I started to Google and realized, well, okay, 2013, that was actually the year of the reading of uh, the paper communicated by Christ to the Royal uh, um, Society. And so this gave us an opportunity to, to get together. Um, the paper was read in December, December 23rd. That may not be the best time to get everyone together. But I thought that we could actually have a conference maybe similar to the, the kind of Christmas carol theme, and to try to celebrate Bay's past, Bay's present, and Bay's future. So we've gathered many of the luminary Bayesians together to try to celebrate all things Bayesian. Okay. And so of course, I'd like to take a little bit of time to thank all of the, uh, the individuals and groups that have made this possible. The Duke University, and uh, we'll have some words from our Vice Provost of Research, Jim Sedow, in just a second. Duke University is the uh, funding from the National Science Foundation for junior researchers, NIS and SAMC uh, for their affiliates. And of course, there are um, awards that are being provided by BEST, IBM, Google, Charles Forbes. And so those award ceremonies will be, awards will be presented actually at the ceremony this evening, so I encourage everybody to, to come and see who the, the winners of all of the, uh, the, the junior researchers, the papers, as well as the, uh, the posters. And of course, there are a number of the publishers, which I didn't have room to put all those icons on the slide, that we'd also like to thank for their support. Okay. So at this time, I'd just like to invite uh, Jim Sia, who is the Vice Provost of Research at Duke University, just to say a few words on behalf of the conference and to welcome everyone to Duke. Thank you, Melissa. For those of you who, who were at yesterday's session in the beginning, you know I actually pretty much spoke yesterday and, and bared my soul of all things Bayesian or that, that I know about. Uh, so I'm not going to do that again. Uh, you'll be lucky to be happy to hear. Uh, in any event, again, on behalf of the Duke University, I'd like to again uh, sort of say what an honor and a privilege it is for us to be helping sponsor this meeting, which uh, obviously for reasons that Melissa just outlined. And I think you're all aware of it. It's a very important meeting uh, to, to, be, to sort of continue to look at, at the development of Bayesian statistics. And uh, again, we're very thrilled and honored to be uh, to be part of this, uh, this occasion. I uh, hope you uh, continue to have a wonderful meeting. Okay, so actually our first speaker in the session is Stephen Stigler from the University of Chicago. He's the Ernest DeWitt Distinguished Service Professor and Chairman of the Department of Statistics 
at the University of Chicago. Many of you may know him as an expert on the history of statistics. He's authored several books on the history of statistics. He's written uh, a number of papers about who discovered Bayes and what was the actual title of uh, that, the essay. Um, there are lots of questions about actually this image of whether it is actually Bayes, and I'm sure maybe he'll enlighten us a little bit more about that. Um, um, so anyway, I'm delighted to, to welcome Steve to actually uh, present the first paper, and then we'll actually have a second paper by uh, uh, Srinivasa Arada Mudin from Duke University, and we're very delighted to have actually... Lori. Oh, actually, Lori is on. She is going to make it first. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, so, so he will actually be reading Lori's paper. Well, actually, he's going to be reading the, the Reader's Digest condensed version of Lori's <laughs> Yeah, the, the uh, statisticians with ADD couldn't handle the whole paper, so. Okay. So we'll have these two presentations this morning. <laughs> Steve, thank you. Thank you. Do we have to do anything to set it up, or? Oh, oh yeah. Is it Thomas Bay's presentation? Or Bay's 250? The trouble is everybody comes to a meeting like this and they always title their talk Duke. <laughs> is it Thomas? And so you look up there and it's Duke, 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 Duke. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's that not one. me. That's the next one. <laughs> it's, uh, it looked fine at home. Let's try that one. <laughs> there we go. Okay. okay. Start from the beginning. Yeah. There we go. Well, it, it's a pleasure to be back at Duke on a, on a noble occasion, and I am going to, I hope, uh, have something new for everybody, uh, despite the age of the topic. And I'm going to be wandering around so that uh, we'll see whether this camera works well, but that's okay. Um, I call this a posterior estimate of Thomas Space, and I begin by giving an answer to the birthday problem there. Uh, we know he did, what day he died, we know how old he was, 59, uh, but the date of birth is, is at this speaking, unknown. Uh, I did a Bayesian analysis of this and give the posterior uh, mean as September 10th, 1701. And uh, I think that having a definite date is important because it's party time. <laughs> uh, so uh, I will not tell you about the confidence uh, or credibility interval surrounding that, but I, I will admit that it's non-trivial, <laughs> uh, but party on. Uh, I want to talk about, uh, I have three parts to this talk that are only related because the word Bayes will appear in all of them. Uh, the first is going to be about his paper. I hope I have something new for at least some of you, but it's, it's new this year in any way for everybody. Uh, the uh, second part will involve that picture, and the third part will involve, well, a guest presentation by uh, as close to Bayes as I could get. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, Bayes' essay, is, is, I think everybody knows, was published in, uh, uh, six, in 1760. 64 in the Royal Society Transactions, but it was read to the Royal Society on the 23rd of December in 1763. Next Monday will be the official day of anniversary. Uh, the, uh, it was read by Richard Price, uh, more on that later. Uh, and a year later, uh, in earlier in December, Richard Price read a subsequent uh, follow-up paper, a supplement to Bayes paper to the Royal Society. It was published in 1765. Uh, those two volumes contain the two papers, and so this is the first publication of Bayes' paper, or is it? Uh, the pages it, within there, they're, it's well known. These have been reproduced photographically and otherwise many times. Uh, an essay towards solving a problem in the doctrine of chances by the late Reverend Mr. Bayes, FRS, uh, I now, Price begins, I now send you an essay which I have found among the papers of our deceased friend, Mr. Bayes. Uh, the second article begins, a demonstration of the second rule in the essay towards the uh, solution of a problem in the Doctor of Chances published in, etc. And this is Price himself claims editorship, ed, uh, authorship for that. 
And I think that most of the people here will know roughly the contents of this. Uh, it is in this paper that he presents uh, in, in, with a huge amount of, uh, I'm reporting it here with a huge amount of ana anachronistic modernization. He gives the solution to the, uh, the Bayes by, uh, approach to uh, binomial distribution. If you wish to consider uh, the probability for a Bernoulli trial is P, and suppose that it's uniformly distributed over 0, 1. You observe a, a, with that probability for n trials, you observe a, a count of x successes. The, then he determines the posterior distribution is a beta distribution, uh, gives that beta distribution, and he uh, gives an approximation to the incomplete beta integral to allow you to calculate at least crudely, and it is quite crudely, uh, some probabilities associated with it. Uh, Price's supplement would later present an improvement on, on that approximation to the incomplete beta, and that's what Price, Price did. And you know that it's tied to a, 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 a fanciful uh, billiard table. He doesn't use the word billiard, but that's what everybody knows he had in mind, and, and uh, thought of that as an analogy, analogy for uh, framing this problem. <laughs> I'm not going to discuss all that. It's discussed in many books, including my own. And uh, I assume that for many of the audience, it's, it's, it's quite familiar. It is a, a beautiful, rigorous, uh, nice treatment by a fellow with a good mathematical mind. That much we know. I want to instead turn to something that seems particularly superficial. I want to turn to the title. An essay toward solving a problem in the doctrine of chances. I submit that that is one of the worst titles that's ever been given to any paper anywhere. <laughs> it tells you absolutely nothing. If you were to pick up a modern, except for the anachronistic or the antiquarian sound to it, if you were to pick up a journal today and see that title, you would pass immediately past it and go to whatever was next. You would not say, oh, gee, I wonder what that's about. Uh, it is a terrible title, and, uh, and, and what I want to report to today is that it was not the title, uh, and I'll tell you how I learned this. I only learned this in early February of this year. Uh, I got, it turn, and the following turns out to be the case, that, that in the, at this time in the Royal Society, if you were presenting a paper as Price was, you had the option at your cost of ordering off prints, much like modern times, or at least what used to be modern times, uh, pre-modern times now. <laughs> now you, you get an e-print. I mean, hey, uh, nobody has a closet full of e-prints, do you? <laughs> the, um, the, uh, and, and, and Price did. He ordered 50 off prints. Now, what's the difference between an off print? What does an off print mean? Well, the off-print is, is, and I in fact checked, as you see, uh, textually identical to the published article with one, in, in all important ways, except one. And that is, you have a separate title page attached. And uh, I learned about this when I got a bookseller's catalog in, uh, in about the 1st of February uh, from Britain, uh, from London. And it was offering a copy of Bayes off print for 45,000 pounds. <laughs> now, some of you who have, are old enough to have off prints in your closet, you may be sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so use them carefully. Uh, and uh, that's about $70,000 or more. It's, uh, and and uh, of course, I. I didn't order it. <laughs> I have limits, but I learned from the bookseller later that it sold fast. I don't know who bought. But the bookseller did include in his catalog a photograph of that title page, and that was an eye opener. Here it is: a totally different title. A method of calculating the exact probability of all conclusions founded on induction. Wow! <laughs> no paper could live up to that title. <laughs> but it is one that you would pick up the pick up the journal and look at. <laughs> now, uh, this is not a later thing. At the time that these off prints were being issued, they were being issued often before the journal was published. 
Uh, this is not something that was that was an after necessarily an afterthought. Why it's different in the journal uh, is unclear. But as you can see, the other title appears in the off print on page three, and uh, uh, this is not from the catalog, but from a, a, an actual copy. Uh, is a, 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 but the title that appeared in the journal is what Price at least viewed as the subtitle. Uh, and the, the bold title is only on the off print. Uh, this, Price also did this with respect to the, uh, this, the supplementary. Uh, here we have a supplement to the essay on a method of calculating the exact probability of all conclusions founded on induction by Richard Price. This particular copy was presented to Yale uh, our University Library uh, by Price in the 1780s. Uh, there's another copy of this in uh, Philadelphia, in the uh, uh, Philadelphia Library Company, uh, and it's Benjamin Franklin's personal copy. Uh, Ed, I told you I'd <laughs> point that out. It's right down the street from you. Um, and, and, uh, and so these two things have been, have been working there, and nobody has known about them. I certainly didn't know about them, and I haven't found anybody who did. But they, they, they give, uh, and what I want to talk about with respect to them, though, is the story that they give some sub some support to. And I'm going, this will be speculative uh, to a degree, but uh, the facts is, on which the speculation is based, I will report in our, uh, our sound. Uh, the first fact is that in 1748, something remarkable happened in the uh, College of Letters, the Republic of Letters in the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, David Hume published a volume called Philosophical Essays Concerning Human Understanding. He changed the title at a later printing, but this was the first edition. And in that, he included for the first time an essay he'd written a decade or so earlier called Of Miracles. And uh, his, his, his essay on miracles was, uh, was caused a firestorm uh, in the intellectual community and the religious community. It was an attack on miracles, as, uh, and particularly on the evidential basis for miracles. It was a probabilistic attack, a likelihood-based attack in a way. He said, uh, a, a miracle is a violation of natural law. Um, uh, which is more likely, that a natural law is violated, or the guy who told you it was violated got it wrong? <laughs> and, and that was no contest. <laughs> Uh, and and, uh, uh, and he, he, he knew he was going to be causing trouble with this. That's why he didn't publish it a decade earlier. Uh, and he did. It was a big, big storm. And, and here is my reconstruction about what happened. And I will say this is based on the fact that there is a manu the manuscript for Bayes' paper does not exist as far as anybody knows. But there is a fragment of work on it that does exist in a notebook, in a dated notebook from before December, just before December uh, 1748, the same year. And uh, so in mid, uh, Hume publishes the essay on miracles. It causes an uproar. And by December, Bayes has worked through a large part of his, uh, his paper. Uh, why? Well, uh, for a very simple reason is the speculation. Uh, and it's this, that Bayes' uh, paper was a re conceived of, and this is speculation, as a rejoinder to Hume. That would say, in effect, that yes, it is true that, uh, that, a strong, that weak evidence will not overcome strong prior opinions, but the multiplication of weak evidence can. That, the, uh, that if you have many observations, no matter, it may be random and, and, uh, and variable, uh, if they're independent, uh, that's a, a, an emphasis that was not so present at some early times, but uh, then it can overcome strong conclusions. This was not a quantitative attack on, on uh, Hume, it, or reply to Hume, it was a, a qualitative but mathematical attack. It was saying, don't go so fast, Mr. Hume. And in the 1750s, Bayes met Price. We know that. And the speculation is that they must have discussed Hume. They were both dissenting ministers. They both were really interested in this stuff. And, and, it, and it just seems uh, a slam dunk that they must have 
spoken to each other about this topic. Uh, well, okay, and, and Bayes must have told Hume about this. Well, there are other evidence that he's told some other people about it. Uh, then uh, why not, he, why not uh, he would have told, uh, excuse me, Price about it. So Price knew that Bayes had done this. And when, Price, when Bayes died suddenly, and that sort of word comes from a newspaper account, in 1761, Price knew that Bayes had in his papers a, a, an answer, at least a partial answer, to Hume. And he sought out Bayes' papers. This is speculation. We know that he went to them, but whether he, he, the received story had been that he'd been invited to come, but that seems unlikely. If you're invited to a deceased colleague's home and asked to carefully go over the papers and see what's publishable, it isn't always a, a welcome invitation. <laughs> And, uh, but I think, I think Price knew what was there and went looking for it with permission, not without permission. He did get the families okay uh, and, 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 and worked up a paper, the paper he presented in December 1763 and wrote a, a, an approximation uh, improvement uh, the next year. And what evidence is it that uh, for his, what is Price's motivation in this? Price's motivation is the same as Bayes, is my speculation. And I'm not speculating on Price's motivation because in the very next, one of the very next publications he gave was a book called uh, Four Dissertations, in which he employed Bayes' theorem as a weapon against Hume, explicitly with this newly discovered title. Uh, Dissertation four, the importance of Christianity, the nature of historical evidence, and miracles. Uh, this is an attack on Hume. And in footnote on page 360, uh, 396, uh, is proved by mathematical demonstration and, uh, and a method shown of determining the exact probability of all conclusions founded on induction. It's not quoted the way we quote titles now, but there it is. Uh, and he's using this, and he has some numerical examples to show how things would work and how you can calculate probabilities. Uh, but basically, uh, this is an, a, an existence proof that he has in mind a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, the, the wish to, to reply to Hume. And so we have uh, a story of, of, of how this was inspired. Hume's essay led to Bayes' essay led to Price's rewriting, led to Price's publication, led to uh, the, the uh, existence of Bayes' theorem. Now, I have, uh, the mention was made of, of Dennis Lind. I have a, uh, 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 this was, I was already with this anyway, but I want to particularly uh, bring it to your attention in light of the, his recent passing. Uh, I sent a an early draft of this paper, I, I said I got this bookseller's catalog in about the 1st of February, and, uh, and I uh, wrote, I did a lot of work in the interim, but by, by March I was already, had a draft, and, um, and I, among other people, I sent one to Dennis. And uh, because, you know, I want to find out if anybody knew this and what they, and, and Dennis replied in March with a, with a, a full letter, and I wanted to share that, at least one paragraph of it, with you. March 6th, 2013, here we'll put it on. The discovery of a different and more important title to Bayes' paper does clarify, in the way you suggest, the motivation behind the work of Bayes and Price. As an atheist, I find it disappointing that such a basic result should have arisen from a religious query. <laughs> but perhaps it is only to be expected from a period when many learned people were clergymen. <laughs> so uh, this this from Dennis Lindley. Uh, he goes on to discuss a few other things and, uh, uh, and of, of considerable interest, but I'm not going to go through it now. He tells me that his grandson is teaching at the University of Chicago and that he I retain enjoyable memories of my stay in 54-55 with Alan Wallace, Jimmy Savage, Bill Kruskal, and my roommate, Raj Bahadur. Uh, best wishes, Dennis. So, um, so that's, that's part one uh, 
or most of part one. I want to try and summarize what happened subsequent to the publication. Uh, there was Bayes, because of this lousy title, as my in the in the journal, uh, was essentially ignored for half a century or more. Um, there were, it was not entirely ignored. There are a few places one can find reference. Uh, Richard Crisis, which I've already been quoting, uh, Condorcet in the introduction of a, a French uh, journal in 1781 mentioned it briefly with no title. Uh, uh, Priestley, another friend of Price's, uh, the father of oxygen, so to speak, uh, was uh, uh, at Price's funeral mentioned this paper and mentioned it under Price's title, this newly discovered title. Uh, an encyclopedia in 1807 had a, a, an understanding uh, article using Price's title by William Morgan, who was Price's nephew, so we're still in the family there. <laughs> And, uh, and Charles Hutton, uh, in an abridgment of the Royal Society Transactions in 1809, uh, dismissed the paper as unimportant and you know, referred to it by the name from the journal. Uh, and uh, in 1810, Price's works appeared with, that, with the, uh, the Price's title in it. Laplace mentioned it in 1814. Hutton read considered, he must have reconsidered in 1815 in another uh, publication, a dictionary of mathematics, because he quoted Morgan's uh, work completely in verbatim uh, and giving, which gave the Price title. And there's some other, uh, 1816 Lacroix mentioned it without giving it a title, just mentioned Bayes basically. But then in the 1830s, it began to get some mention, uh, especially once it got into some of the works of De Morgan and people picked up on that. And, and there was at least a, a rudimentary uh, salute to Bayes after that. Poisson misspelled the name, but mentioned him briefly in his book, and, and it goes on. But while it's not my topic today, I want to mention that, that there were serious limitations to what was going on in, uh, in, in uh, Bayesian inference in those days. Uh, first, Bayes' paper is tremendously limited. It, his approach is really only for the binomial with a uniform prior. Worked beautifully there. Uh, Laplace did a lot of very good things on inverse probability and a lot of, uh, uh, of really serious statistical problems, proving uh, posterior consistency in some respects. But if you look hard at Laplace, you discover there's serious limitations there that show that there was one key thing even Laplace didn't understand. Uh, Laplace did, uh, did first, he, he used only flat priors, really. There's minor exceptions to that, but they really prove the rule more than anything else. Uh, but what Laplace didn't understand is what came out in Galton's work in the, in the 18, uh, from 1877 to 1885. In 1877, Galton published a machine, a picture of a machine right there, which I've written about a year or two ago. And if you want to learn about it, go to the University of Chicago Statistics Department webpage, click on that picture on the front page of our website, and you'll get a story about it. But basically, it's a machine that does Bayes' theorem, and it does specifically does Bayes' theorem for a, a normal prior, a normal likelihood, and gives you the normal posterior. And Galton worked out the relationship of the variances, too, and that was the first time. In 1885, he went further and considered it all in the context of the library of normal. And it is only there that you find people talking, somebody talking for the first time about a multivariate distribution where you can get different distributions by conditioning on different variables. Uh, multivariate analysis was lacking. Laplace did not have multivariate analysis. He had multivariate objects, but not multivariate analysis. And in one place where he got to a two-parameter problem, he screwed up because of this. So it was, there were serious limitations to the understanding in those early days. But I'll leave that, and I know that uh, Steve is going to pick up on more recent uh, uh, Bayesian work uh, post golf and I think mostly. Anyway, we'll see later. I want to move to the second part of my talk. <laughs> Bayes' pick portrait. Is this Bayes? 
Uh, well, I, I hope so, but uh, <laughs> I'll explain to you what it, where it came from. I claim discovery of this in a certain sense. In the 1970s, I found, whoops, I'm getting the wrong stuff here. What, uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. In the 1970s, I, uh, I found a, a history of, insect, of, of insurance with this picture in it and went to, a, there was a Bayesian meeting in Madison and I made, in my basement, I made some postcards on it. I had a, 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 a dark room and I, I printed out on postcard stocks and postcards and sold them at the meeting. And 50 cents a piece, that was a lot of money back then. Uh, not enough to retire on. I think I still have my copy. <laughs> <laughs> it, they sold fast. 45,000 pounds? Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it would work up. In more recent years, I, I've had a necktie made. Uh, there's there's a Bayes necktie, this picture all over. Steve is wearing one. These are a very rare item, too, by the way. Uh, and, um, and, and so I, I made a little bit out of this. This is, uh, and, and, and so I have a little bit of stock in it. I want to review, this is in the, you know, you reveal your, your interests here uh, these days, transparency. Uh, but I want to tell you about it. First, I want to ask, why are we interested? Why do we care? Well, I want to try to convince you briefly that pictures matter. And I will start with this picture of Jacob Bernoulli, which is, which is repeated in a medal from the Tashkent meeting of the ISI. But, uh, but that portrait was painted in the, while well, he was alive, and, uh, and it, it shows something unusual to me. It shows character. It, and, and how do I, how do I, I I see, I think I see character there, but I also have reason to believe that it should show character. Why? Because I, it is painted by his brother. Now, I don't know how many of you have brothers, but brothers, I have two, and brothers see each other differently. There is no, nothing that is invisible to them. <laughs> they, 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 they're, they're, every flaw is, is apparent. <laughs> and sometimes they, they actually value something, but that's another matter. <laughs> and, and so this is an unusually perceptive painting in the history of science. That sometimes you can learn something by looking at the other picture. This is the way uh, Nicholas Bernoulli, not the famous, he didn't work in probability, but he was a good artist. Uh, did and that's that's a, uh, a very nice portrait. I'll give you another example of a portrait. So this is the most commonly circulated portrait of Laplace. Uh, it was painted 15 years after he died, uh, based on some lithographs. And in fact, almost every portrait of Laplace dates from uh, late in life. That is until this past year. And this past year, a portrait surfaced that was painted when he was 35 years old. And, uh, it, and this particular copy of it is now living in Chicago. Uh, this shows Laplace painted by a society painter of the time in, 18, in 1784, the age of 35. There's an easel behind him where he's gesturing at a, a balance, a, 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 a mechanical balance drawn on the easel, uh, but it shows a young Laplace. It shows somebody with a little bit of confidence in his eye, a, a picture of, of somebody who could actually have done the things that Laplace did. The other one just showed an old man. Uh, portraits can sometimes show a little bit more. There we have Laplace. Another example, there's a picture of Legendre that appeared in my book in 1986. Uh, it turns out that this is a picture of Legendre, but the wrong Legendre. <laughs> this is a low-grade French politician. <laughs> this is not the Legendre that gave us these squares, okay? And that was, only, that was it only brought to my attention a couple of few years back. And so what did the real Legendre look like? Where's the character that we might hope to get from a, from a portrait? Well, there, no, there is no good portrait that I know of, of right the genre, but there is one really telling picture. It's a caricature that was sketched at the time, and this one show is really in line with what I know about the character of the real genre. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Uh, that, he, he, was a, he was a hard case. <laughs> You did not mess with Le Jardin. And, uh, and if you read, there's a letter from him to the Minister of the Interior that I published in the, uh, 
uh, French uh, uh, journal of the history of uh, electronic journal of the history of probability and statistics that will give you some insight into his character uh, and that. So what about Bayes then? Here's the history of life insurance in its formative years compiled from approved sources by Terence O'Donnell, 1936. I looked hard for the source of this picture. The picture appears here. Reverend T. Bayes, improver of the columnar method developed by Barrett. Uh, who's Barrett? <laughs> well, something's wrong here. That becomes easily apparent. Barrett was uh, born when, uh, when Bayes died, Barrett was seven years old. Uh, this was not, he was not working on Barrett's work. In fact, there's no sign he did anything that remotely connected with the columnar method. So the, the caption is baloney. That much is true. Uh, but, but, it's the, in the, but it's strange because there's no mention in this whole book of Bayes. Bayes that's the entire mention of Bayes in this book, that caption, that picture. What's it doing there? Where did it come from? Largely a compilation, the, the introduction of the book says, largely a, a compilation of material which originally appeared in the American Conservationist, 1931-1936. What's that? <laughs> well, it turns out that the University of Chicago Library has that run. <laughs> it is basically a newsletter of a society, of a company called the American Conservation Company, which uh, listed things like uh, it gave it would have an article on who was selling more insurance that month, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> and but it but it was run by a couple of guys who really liked history, and they had free run to put as many pictures as they want in, and they and it's plastered with pictures, and most of those pictures are things you'd recognize. I mean, they're they they were not inventing pictures. These pictures were things they found in various places, and the picture of Bayes and appears there in June of, seven, of 1933 in an article by William Clendenin, uh, who was a, had great energy, and, uh, but not a lot of knowledge. And he says, improver of the columnar method, quoted by Eliezer Wright. Now, he's barely, <coughs> Bayes is barely mentioned in this article. There's a place where he says something about him having something to do with Barrett, which is, as we know, baloney. So, so what is this doing here? Why does he have this? Well, he's confused, it turns out. It wasn't Elisa Wright who had said nice things about Bayes, but as another article in this same series says, it was De Morgan. There, there's a quote, long quotation about Bayes in another article uh, and saying what, how very good he was, uh, but it's like by Augustus De Morgan. So, he's, so the author has just been plastering pictures all over without thinking about what he's doing, and Bayes got in there. But he surely didn't invent the picture because he didn't need a picture. There was no demand for a picture. There was no need for a picture. So where did it come from? Well, there's a hint. Uh, the month before, the month after this, uh, he gives a picture of Thomas Simpson. And this is, in fact, uh, the only picture we know about Thomas Simpson, too. So they're both in the same camp. and they. They look like they could well have been from the same source. And that and the rest of the pictures in these magazines and books don't have this particular format. These two look like they may have come from the same place. And in this article, he says here at the bottom, the portrait is from a lost classic in the wing collection of the Newbury. That's the Newbury Library in Chicago. Well, that obviously leads to the next step, which I have not yet taken. This is an interim report. That is to go through the wing collection at the Newbury Library in Chicago and find out what book has pictures of these two guys. And uh, I may someday have the energy to do that, but uh, I, I freely, uh, if somebody else wants to try that, I will uh, give them free reign uh, as long as they communicate the results to me. Um, my guess, and it's just a guess, is that somewhere there is a book in there that sketches some of the early members of the Royal Society of London, uh, and uh, and that these two appear there. When was that published? Was it was it old and close to contemporary? Was it more recent in the 20th century? Was it? I don't know, but it could lead to a little bit more information on the lineage. In the meantime, I will submit that the portrait of Bayes that we have here is the very best portrait of Bayes. It's the only portrait of Bayes. <laughs> uh, 
there are no others, there are no competitors. And, and it, I took it once to the uh, leading library, I think it's called the Sir George Williams Library in London, of dedicated to their dissenting ministers and showed it. They have an oil painting there of Bay's father, Joshua. Uh, and I showed it to the expert there. And he looked at it and he said, well, you know, I don't know. It would not be a formal portrait. He's not wearing a wig. But uh, so he, he wasn't clear. He wasn't sure about anything. He said he couldn't rule it out, couldn't rule it in. Uh, this is from a, a real expert in, in the uh, history of the dissenting church. Uh, so basically, you're in a situation where, where we don't know. And I'll return to the picture a little bit later, but that's, that's my update on, on the validity of Bay's portrait. Uh, let me go to part three. And this is where I get to the modern age and to Jimmy Savage. Uh, Jimmy was a founder of our department at the University of Chicago with Alan Wallace. And uh, Jimmy was uh, uh, published his book in, uh, in 1954 and began work on it while he was at the University of Chicago. Um, and he wrote it in Chicago. Uh, it was, uh, he was at Chicago until 1960, and, and he left a, a, a very firm imprint upon, upon us. Uh, if you look, uh, there are a lot of papers that survive at Chicago, and I, I've been gathering things together with the eye of maybe something, doing something about them, but uh, here are some notes on a course he, for a course he gave on the foundations of statistics in 1951, winter quarter. Uh, and and uh, it was a, for private circulation. And he has a list of references at the end where he does cite the facsimiles of, of Bay's paper that, that uh, had been published by Molina in the 1940s. And um, he, uh, uh, so he read Bayes, but, but Bayes was never, now, then or later, a major influence on Jim. Uh, Defanetti was, but not Bayes. Bayes was, was interesting. He valued Bayes. He went back to Bayes' paper in, in 1960. And there's a reading note he circulated in March of 1960 on Bayes, seven pages long. Uh, and and he, he talks about it with, a, with great intelligence and interest, but this was not a formative moment for him, the encounter with Bayes. It was instead something that was quite interesting to him, but not a formative moment. But, Bay, but Jenny still has something to tell us about Bayes, and he's going to tell us today. In my researches on the history of the department for a, a book that appeared recently, I got much too much, much material put into the book. And, um, and, and one of the things I, I traced down is, is some of Alan Wallace's papers and Jimmy's papers, and discovered the following interesting fact that uh, Jimmy and Alan had been the co-founders, really, of our department. They'd known each other at the Statistical Research Group in Washington. Uh, they come separately to Chicago, Jimmy, to the, uh, I think it was the radio biology lab, uh, and Alan to the business school, uh, but with the idea that he would work on starting this program in statistics. And, and they started the Committee on Statistics, in, uh, which became a department later. Uh, started the work in 1949, and uh, in 1956 we became a department. And Jimmy was the first chair. Uh, and uh, Alan was on leave that year. He was at the Center for uh, Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And uh, and when Alan and Alan and Jimmy were really quite close, Alan was not a particular influence on Jimmy. I don't believe that was the case. Alan was. But Alan recognized Jimmy's qualities to a very high degree. And, uh, and Alan was a really sharp guy in his own way. And, and Jimmy enjoyed him. And, um, and they, uh, they, they would communicate even when apart. And, and Alan invented a way of communication. And that was he bought a couple of machines that were on the market called the Soundscriber. Uh, these were di for dictation in offices, basically. You could you'd talk into them and make a record. Little green plastic, flimsy plastic record, and then you'd make. And then, and Alan's idea was they both would have these machines, and then when they wanted to communicate, instead of trying long distance across the country or long distance to England, uh, they would record the disc and 
failed. Uh, long distance was not so easy in those days. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, uh, and it was, there was a challenge in this because, uh, because uh, uh, the machine ran on American current. And when, uh, one, when I think when Jimmy was in, in England, he had a troublesome time finding a, an adapter that could plug it in. But, but they worked out one way or another. And when Alan was out in California and Jimmy was in Chicago, they would be exchanging his discs a little bit, not too frequently, some of them. And I found, I have in Chicago a couple of discs uh, from Alan to Jimmy, and they aren't particularly interesting, and they're marred by the fact that somebody filed them with a paper clip over the, uh, to put a warp on the record. You can play these things on a modern record player. These are, <laughs> these are records, uh, you know, really flimsy records. But in, uh, in the archives of Alan's papers in Rochester, University of Rochester, there are a couple, and I, Paid Rochester, uh, uh, not very much, but they, they put them on a CD. And I moved the CD onto my iPhone. And, uh, and I have an extract of a particularly interesting portion of Jimmy's communication to Alan uh, to play for you. Let's see if this works. Now I don't need Siri's help. <laughs> uh, I want this one. Let's plug it in. Now, I'm going to play this, but I also have a transcription to show you. So I'm going to, uh, to move. This is Jimmy Savage to Alan Wallace on the 20th of October, 1956. And, uh, oh, wait, no, let's see. This isn't the one I want. Let me just, sorry about this. We'll, uh, I want... Uh, Ah, there we are. It's only two minutes long. The uh, trifle of mine here that I want to mention is that you may remember that in the ditto that in the draft of my book, on the earliest ditto draft, I attributed to R.A. Fisher a, uh, the expression, the idea that uh, the extension of the R distribution washes out in a large sample but there ought to be uh, some intrinsic way of analyzing the data in itself without ever uh, postulating a prior distribution at all. I don't remember whether I am criticized that I'm not stop, but it's not the valid, of course, because the um, prior distribution uh, does, does wash out, does so on the exponentially, and uh, the rate at which it flushes out uh, does depend considerably on what part of distribution it is. Uh, thus, for example, uh, I'm very firmly um, convinced that uh, uh, extensory perception uh, does not uh, exist. Uh, it takes tremendous amounts of, uh, of data to. Uh, to of relevant posing data to bring me to the opposite point of view. Well, uh, the thing was, we couldn't find this passage anywhere in Fisher, and when I wrote him, he said, well, it's ridiculous. He never could have said any such thing. Uh, but Bob Schaefer had found the reference for me, <laughs> and uh, it's in uh, paper number four of uh, Fisher's uh, collected papers. Uh, it's the passage that's described on pages 286 and 287. I thought you might like to look at it for yourself. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yes, it is there. This is uh, Two New Properties of, Max of uh, Mac Mathematical Likelihood by Ronald Fisher. And, uh, let me, uh, and while I'm not going to read the whole passage, you can see that 
Indeed, it says that as the number of observations has increased indefinitely, the conclusions drawn will depend more and more entirely on the facts observed and less and less upon the supposed knowledge a priori introduced into the argument. And he goes on to make exactly the suggestion that he would deny later on. So this is Jimmy talking to us. I want to close today with a couple of observations that bring Jimmy and bring things together. And we'll start with the following. Who embodied Thomas Bayes in the 1900s? And I want to submit that it was the person we just were listening to. Look, look at the eyebrows. Look at the hair. Look at the ear, the mouth, the chin. Okay, now, I think it's a striking resemblance. If you had a pattern recognition program, I think it might even kick two of them out as kin. I don't have a genetic sample. Now, but Jimmy's been gone since the early 70s. And so the question came up, I was talking with Ed George last night about who, if Sharon's book is made into a movie, who would play Thomas Bayes? And I have a suggestion. And the suggestion is the modern incarnation, namely Charlie Sheen. Now, I hope this isn't taken too seriously. There would be problems down that road. But I still present it to you as a possibility. And with that, I will leave you with the proper title for Bayes' paper, A Method of Calculating the Exact Probability of All Conclusions Founded on Induction. And join you in a not quite exciting toast to the Reverend Thomas Bayes after 250 years of his paper. And I don't know if we have time to take a couple of questions, but I know we have another piece coming up. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll have Sabrina Ross speak, and then we have time for questions right before the break. Okay. And I'll leave this here. Actually, we could probably take one question while he gets his slides set up. Any outrage? You're welcome to use this if you want, or you can just use the arrows. Do we can put the other? Yeah. We've got to get his talk up. Yeah, this slide. All right.
in the set about 1780, a few years after that first thing. I don't disagree with that. Uh, you didn't mention ghosts at all. When did he first mention the name Bates? Uh, I don't think he mentioned the name Bates. He did use it in the in his work in, on uh, Lee Square. So right. He gives it. He's one of the few people who give a principal use of it. Uh, most people used them, made an unprincipled use of inverse probability in their early work in that century. And, uh, and just sort of, uh, uh, they, they were uh, just, just making assumptions and throwing things around and getting the answers they wanted without understanding any real basis for that argument. Now, Gus did some kind of Mulliverian. Mulliverian? There were Mulliverian objects in the air. Laplace gave the bivariate uh, distribution of two regression coefficients in a multiple regression situation. Uh, and uh, Lagrange proved the uh, multivariate normal approximation to the multinomial distribution in the 1770s. But these were multivariate objects, but they did not consider them in the way we consider them, where they were asking the kinds of questions that, uh, that we would ask of the con conditionality based on that. And the idea that you could get a conditional density from a multivariate by finding the marginal and dividing it is not something. Laplace himself would simply work in terms of proportionality, uh, uh, essentially a flat prior idea, and, and just simply said, well, it, it's proportional. And you vary the other object, uh, you get another distribution. But he would then make it into a distribution. But, but he ran into troubles because he didn't have the fundamental logic of the multivariate analysis behind him. When he had three observations, the proportionality became a little more vexed, and he did the wrong thing in one example. Uh, so, that, so that while he was a, a very good fellow, he, he was not beyond error. And I really don't think you can find anybody with the conception until you get to around uh, uh, at post Altman period. What happened uh, between What's that? early? Yeah, let's let's okay. uh, let's thank Steve again. Oh, oh, sorry. No. So we had asked the dean yeah, okay. of, of arts and science, Lori Patton, to to uh, say a few words at the opening event, and she responded, "Well, I would be delighted to provide a presentation on Thomas Bay. She's an accomplished uh, scholar of religious uh, studies as well." And so she provided a 19-page tome on Thomas Bay, uh, but of course she is unavailable to actually be here. She's off in uh, Singapore at the moment. And so we have uh, Serena Bas uh, Abrahamudin, who is the Dean of Humanities, who has graciously uh, agreed to fill in for Lori, and so we'll provide some more remarks on the human history of Thomas Bay. Oh, so thank, thank you, Marie. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes? OK. So. Um, I'm here as Laurie's mouthpiece. I'm her colleague, Dean of Humanities, and she's a humanist as well. Um, so this is her paper, which I'm not going to read out in its entirety, but I'm going to try and summarize. Um, I do know something about the 18th century, although I'm not a statistician or a mathematician. Um, I'm the incoming president of the American Society for 18th Century Studies in a couple of years. So I have heard and have read something about Thomas Space. So it helps me uh, be the, um, the uh, sort of replacement uh, speaker for you today. But of course, I'm here to, uh, to give you uh, Laurie's paper, which, which I will summarize. Um, just a couple of remarks from her introductory to all of you. She wants to welcome you as Dean of Arts and Sciences and uh, congratulate the organizers of the conference, the Department of Statistics in particular, and uh, for the ongoing uh, contributions to the life of the college and the university. Whether it is um, statistics contests for undergraduates, anniversary celebrations of the department, or the upcoming national conference for women in statistics being hosted at Duke, this department knows how to throw an intellectual party, which uh, my predecessor also talked about. She especially wants to recognize Alan Gatman and Marie's Clyde. Um, but of course, she's sending her comments from China. Um, she also, uh, speaking about uh, the claim that the previous speaker made about potential uh, family resemblances to Bayes, uh, Laurie herself would like to claim this 
very interesting coincidence. She studied at the University of Edinburgh in the same divinity faculty as Bayes did, and at about the same age, but except it was 260 years later. <laughs> she also comes from an old New England family of Unitarians from England, the same rationalist theological tradition that many of Bayes' Presbyterian friends ultimately embraced in England. She hasn't done the ancestral charts yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some ancient family connection. And she was at the University of Chicago, maybe a little bit later than your colleague, who, who you said might have a biological redundancy to base. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm stating on thin ice here, so maybe. All right. <laughs> so um, she um, wants to say that she especially was helped by Dale's um, most honorable groom, who liked and worked with Thomas Bayes in the Springer series, and D.R. Bellhouse's biographical work in the science. Okay. So uh, let me move on to her paper. Today she wants to consider three particular aspects of Bayes' theological thinking that may have colored his mathematical thinking, and she has a couple of hypotheses that she would like to lay before you. Um, the first thing is, of course, the um, the point that Bayes came from a non-conformist tradition. Um, what was at stake was the Book of Common Prayer, which was completed in 1549, but after Queen Mary ascended the throne, it was outlawed, and its author and advocate, Thomas Cranmer, was burned at the stake. When Elizabeth ascended the throne, Mary's sister, of course, the Book of Common Prayer was reinstated, and a law of conformity passed, which required all churches to use it. During the Commonwealth period, until 1660, churches were allowed to worship in their own manner. But after the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II in 1660, another act of conformity was passed, which again required the Book of Common Prayer to be used in all churches. Um, so the act of toleration finally in 1688, the Glorious Revolution, allowed the non-conforming churches of the day Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists to worship as they please. But still, members of these churches could not hold offices nor gain a place at England's universities. As a result, the nonconformists created their own institutions, particularly educational ones, called dissenting academies, where young men, and particularly clergy, were educated. In addition, many of these young men were educated in Scotland and Holland. Um, and Bayes comes from this kind of tradition, which is important to lay out. His father and his uncle, Samuel Bates, uh, were well-known nonconformists in northern England. Uh, oops, what did I do here? Sorry. Um, so we just need to go to the next slide. Um, so, um, going back to the earlier point, um, Laurie would like to say something about the Calvinist doctrines and ideas, which she wants to discuss a little bit more. Uh, in 1720, um, Thomas Bayes arrives in Edinburgh to study divinity at the um, to study divinity at the University of Edinburgh, and um, he had to take several preliminary exams, but he studied divinity and logic over there. And uh, his family friend, William Ward, wrote to Bayes in 1720, the order which you follow in the rest of your studies I cannot but highly approve of. In occupying yourself simultaneously with both mathem mathematics and logic, you will more clearly and easily notice what and how much each of these excellent instruments <coughs> contributes to the directing of thought and sensation. Um, she would like to return a little bit later, which I will, to this notion of excellent instruments, which is a theologically very significant phrase. Uh, Bayes then returned to London, presumably was ordained, and eventually took up residence as a minister for a Presbyterian congregation in Tunbridge Wells, a highly cosmopolitan and unusually bustling town because of its healing springs. One mid 18th century, um, I actually have. Something on Tunbridge Wells later, that's okay. One mid 18th century visitor writes of the town Tunbridge Wells. That year there were Hungarians, Italians, French, Portuguese, Irish, 
and Scots. In terms of religious elites, there were Jews and Roman Catholics, as well as quaint Puritans and rigid Presbyterians. To another friend, uh, she wrote, Tunbridge seems the very parliament of the world where every country and every rank has its representatives. She goes on to say to the same recipient, for my part, I am diverted with the medley, the different characters are amusing, especially at the ball, unquote. The point that Laurie wants to make here is the very cosmopolitan nature of Tunbridge Wells, despite the name that sounds like a provincial town in southern England. Um, before turning to the heart of the paper, there's one more point that Laurie wants to make, which is the, uh, the fact that Bayes' religious views, um, it might seem anomalous, you know, in the way that the previous paper also mentioned the fact that he's a clergyman, but for instance, um, William Durham, uh, uh, slightly later, uh, 1798 clergyman, uh, makes the point that um, the life of leisure that a country gentleman has allows a clergyman to do philosophy, to labor in the vineyard of God as well as that of science, and that uh, there is the leisure to experiment. And you know, this is uh, very important. So now we'll go to the three points, which is the heart of uh, Dean Patton's paper, three kinds of religious views that may have affected uh, Bayes' intuitions about the doctrine of chance. Um, as Laurie understands it, Bayes' theorem is a way of working out the likelihood of some event given a particular piece or pieces of evidence which might modify the basic situation. Each prediction of probability has to be calculated based on the new pieces of evidence that are introduced into any given situation. In the Bayesian perspective, probability measures a degree of belief. If we follow Bayes' theorem, then we mathematically link the degree of belief in a proposition before and after accounting for the evidence. So what Laurie would like to say is that the idea of the probability of belief is linked to Bayes' theological view. Bayes' life testifies that there was this connection in his mind. And as a historian of religion, Laurie would like to see how this link is something to be pursued further. And the first point that she wants to make is about Calvinism. Calvinist doctrine is, as you know, I don't want to get too much into that, which is something very important for the 18th century. Um, but Calvin, uh, the main point that, for those of you who are hazy about the history of religion, is that um, Calvin argues that God's grace and not human action is a vehicle for salvation for an irredeemably fallen humanity. So uh, in that context, God is wholly transcendent, and therefore God's relationship to his creatures is wholly voluntary. That voluntary commitment by God to his creatures is called the covenant, and that covenant is permanent, unchanging, and unchangeable. At the same time, because of the covenant, um, acting in the world involves discovering the moral and the natural law for the human being. And so in that context, um, there's a new covenant that comes in that of God's grace for the purposes of redemption. And, and human effort is about um, saving oneself depending on the use of every person's active reasoning faculty. And with, with God's given grace, with the uses of reason, reading, and so on, as revealed through the Bible. So this is the first point of the three points that Rory wants to make, which is that there's this most basic connection to Bayes' ideas through Calvinism. In other words, the flawed humanity meant that no particular form of human measurement can be perfect or complete in its own right, as it's only God who has the sole prerogative to have perfect um, you know, knowledge and wisdom and measurement. Therefore, any form of human measurement must be modified by another form of measurement, given that measurement itself is human. In this context, probability, understood as belief, was imperfect and had to be modified by new information. And so new information keeps adjusting your ability to, to get to, say, a better approximation of the truth. And so belief or faith in Calvinist theology was never perfect, but always had to be open to new information 
which could be a vehicle for God's saving grace. So it's not just you know science, but a kind of self-improvement, which is part of Italian's theology. Just as humanity was fallen and imperfect, humans and human measurements were infinitely subject to revision. And that's why it's probability and this whole thing you're you know, changing your uh, wisdom on the basis of your information becomes part of the theology of the case, uh, a rational uh, cabinet. The second point, um, I put some things down here just as, as bullet points extrapolated from Lori's paper. But the second point that she wants to make is about this whole idea of the instrument. Because in um, Christian theology, and especially Calvinist doctrine, um, there were also multiple other sects. And I'm listing some of them, you know, um, uh, um, Socinians, Socinians, Arians, A-R-I-A-N-S, right? Uh, Arianism, um, and other forms of uh, dissenting sects, those of whom were not conformists in a general milieu of which Bayes was a part. And the argument was, of course, about the role of Jesus, because Jesus in Christian theology was often considered as God's instrument, his instrument for the salvation of mankind. Now, what did these dissenting sects do? There were multiple schisms and so on, which we can't get into here if we don't have time. But the big, biggest argument with all of these multiple sects was about the role of Jesus and how necessary an instrument he was to the saving work of God. And this resulted in you know, Unitarians, Socinians, Arians, and many others. But the point about Jesus was that while he was, for the dissenting sects, an instrument of salvation, the point that was made them heretical is that many of them said that Jesus was not perfect, even though he was God's son and so on. He was not a perfect instrument because he was nonetheless human, right? But then special human, of course. And so there was that idea of the Trinity or Trinitarianism that tried to create an idea of the per Jesus as a perfect instrument. This was being, um, to some degree, uh, questioned by multiple dissenting sects. And so if even Jesus, as God's own instrument, was not perfect, it was a way of saying that Instruments, any kind of instrument, whether it was Jesus, which is the most perfect, but still not perfect enough instrument, and therefore any, any other human instruments should be understood as inherently modifiable and forever open to correction. So even Christianity uh, was itself something that needed to self correct, understand itself, improve its theology, and um, it's because even divine instruments such as Jesus should not be understood as perfect, but as lesser beings. Um, I'll get to that in a second. The third point <coughs> is uh, about the one theological work that Bayes himself did author in 1731 called Divine Benevolence. And in that, I'll sort of summarize briefly here, um, Bayes argues that God, well, the knowledge-seeking pro project is about trying to try and accuracy the way that we were talking about, trying to improve and modify information to get to, say, closer approximations of truth. Uh, the point that Bayes makes in the one work he authored, uh, Divine Benevolence, is that God is ultimately not motivated by rectitude, but by goodness or benevolence. In other words, it's not just about being right. There was a big debate that he was entering in at that time about whether uh, you know, the whole point was to be correct. And this point is that the goodness, God's emphasis is on benevolence, not just on rectitude. And in his and this has an implication for the second section. God in his benevolence gave everyone the most happiness that they were capable of. And um, the key phrases here are every imaginable circumstance and maximizing happiness suited to the faculties, dependencies, and freedom of his rational creature. And, and this, in this context, Laurie would like to suggest that the Bayesian view of probability is a mathematical way toward representing every imaginable circumstance, which is what he's talking about in the uh, essay on divine benevolence. For Bayes, 
all possible notions of infinite benevolence can be expressed, quote, in the same way as mathematicians do ultimate ratios to which quantities ever tend and never arrive, unquote. Bayes also assumes that creatures are rational and should maximize that rational capacity in a free manner. We spoke about this. But in so doing, they will see that they're both dependent upon circumstance as well as proof. So a Bayesian theorem is at its most basic a modeling of the possible outcomes of any situation, a modeling where people exercise their rational faculties, but also calculate and account for the dependencies which are in any given situation. So I'm going to conclude now. Um, I just wanted to, that was the issue of the imperfection of measurement that um, I brought up in relation to Jesus. The imperfection of instruments, right? Jesus was an instrument of salvation. He was not a perfect instrument for determining his God. Um, and um, one more example of the imperfect instrument Lori wanted to bring up is the uh, discovery of, of the invention of photography in the late 19th century. Um, technology is understood as an instrument. Now, daguerreotypes were actually rejected by theologians because they were considered a little too perfect. They were diminished, perfect work of God because they simply just, you know, there was no manipulation. Whereas calotypes that involved the manipulation of the image on silver paper involved some human instrumentality. And for some reason, that slight imperfection made them a little bit more possible to use. And so the paradox in the theological context in the late 19th century was that calotype was considered much more theologically acceptable as an imperfect instrument because it's more human in its scale. Um, I, I just wanted to go through, um, I made this point already, uh, check for the conclusion. Um, um, so the so the three points to remind again of the Calvinist origin, the issue of the perfect instrument or how imperfect the instrument is, and the use of rational faculties in relationship to external contingencies to understand God's motivation. So those are the three points. Uh, the Bayesian doctrine of God models right belief in the assumption that human situations are inherently dependent and imperfect and that human happiness can be understood or calculated on the basis of those dependencies. And because measurement is imperfect, as many different human conditions as possible should be taken into account in assessing any person's happiness in relationship to the divine. So in other words, this whole investment in statistics, you can think about it as divorced from theology, but what Laurie wants to say is that for Bayes, who was a theologian, it was actually a way of working out man's place in the world in relation to divine benevolence, to work out the whole table, if you like, of multiple uh, possibilities. So Bayesian doctrines of chance uh, model probability based on the assumption that situations are contingent, contingent and probability should be calculated according to those contingencies. The excellent instruments are both necessary and yet forever incomplete, forever open to the possibility that a new condition will emerge that changes the statistical picture. And there's the photograph again. Um, and I thought this was a nice thing I found of, at Tunbridge Wells, where it says Thomas Bayes, that's the plaque on the building, non-conformist minister and mathematician, originator of the statistical theory of probability, the basis of most market research opinion polling techniques. Think of what we have brought upon the world. <laughs> okay, so uh, the last sentence of Laurie's remarks um, is that she hopes this little thought experiment about the theology was useful for you. Uh, let me end by saying I'm proud.